This is Episode 6 of Project Ungoverned, the online learning landscape. In our concluding episode of this podcast series, before our symposium in January, we look at new enabling technologies and the future of online learning. This is Project Ungoverned, a podcast looking at the brave new world of online education. New ways of learning, new ways of teaching, and the promise of unprecedented access to education. The boom in new education technology has sparked a gold rush, attracting new companies, global institutions, and investors. But who creates the rules of engagement and who enforces them? Is online learning ungoverned? I'm Nicole Harkin, an award-winning writer and former good government analyst. And I'm Dr. Kim Oakes, an education strategist specializing in ed tech and international education. Together in this six episode podcast series, We talk to educators, learners, visionaries, and pioneers in online education from across the globe to look at the possibilities, challenges, and governance of online learning. Will online learning revolutionize educational access and opportunity? Or will it accelerate a downward spiral in educational quality? And what role will governance and related issues such as accountability, transparency, and inclusiveness play in determining the outcome? Join us as we explore the landscape of online education. Welcome to today's episode, which is the final in our series on the online learning landscape before our virtual symposium on the 24th of January in 2019. In this episode, we look at the future of online education and enabling technologies with our guest, Alex Kaplan from IBM Watson. Alex first explained his role at IBM and the focus of his work. So I work with advanced technologies at IBM. I'm a part of an organization called Watson Education, which is uh, a part of IBM Research. And our focus is on the application of these technologies to the transformation of education. I'm also a member of the IBM Industry Academy, which is the group within IBM that helps set global strategy for the industries around the world. So I represent education in the academy. There's about 400 of us uh, across all the industries that IBM works with. So we're really focused in a number of different areas. It all sort of circles around this concept of the application of advanced technologies. So over the course of the last few years, artificial intelligence has been a primary focus for us. And so in the Watson world, the idea is that Watson is a computer that's able to learn and able to self-learn. And so we can train Watson to learn about all sorts of things in the education space. We're training it to understand curricula. We train it to understand student mastery of skill. We train it to provide feedback to teachers. It can provide insight into the skill mastery for students. So we can look at uh, information about how a student has mastered a skill. We can look at information about their social background, what their interests are, what their learning styles might be, and we can better tailor personalized learning experience for them. We anchor all of this in learning science because we want to make sure that the technology uh, reflects the way that humans actually learn. And so as we provide the artificial intelligence tools, uh, we provide them in a manner that's really anchored uh, in the science of how people learn. It also gives us the ability to provide a significant degree of transparency to the whole education ecosystem, to all stakeholders, information about how a student is being assessed, where the data is coming from, to what purpose is being put, uh, what kind of decisions we can put in front of a teacher to make. And so it's been a really powerful tool uh, from, from that perspective. Alex is describing a new frontier in learning. As an example of their work, Alex told us about a project IBM had done with Pearson to create a more interactive learning experience with textbooks using artificial intelligence. Pearson is the largest provider of instructional materials at the higher education level in the world. And so if you're reading, you're online and you're, you're working through a Pearson textbook, Uh, you can actually see Watson is embedded in that textbook. So as I'm working through, let's say, um, something on on the solar system, the moons and the planets, if I hit a a point uh, where I'm struggling to understand gravity, as an example, I can actually ask Watson uh, to explain gravity to me, and Watson will point me to instructional materials that help me master it. And then Watson would then query me to determine whether or not I understood it. So it would actually ask me a question about gravity. It might ask me a question saying, you know, uh, what's responsible for the movement of the ocean on Earth? 
And can you explain how that works? I would provide an answer to it. I would say, well, you know, the moon's gravitational pull affects how the oceans on the earth move around. And Watson would say, yes, you have that right. So that's a very concrete example. Alex went on to explain the technology behind the textbook example. The old school style for doing this is a linked database. I tend to refer to it as an if-then-but statement approach to it. It's a tree decision. So the difference here is that Watson is actually reading and is and understands the entire corpus of material. So again, let's say I'm doing a, this project on the planets and the solar systems. Watson knows everything in there. So anything that I've trained Watson on about planets and the solar system, it knows. So when you go in and you ask that question, Watson is dynamically responding to your question. Uh, and it's dynamically pointing you to places in the instructional materials that would allow you to master it. So every student's experience is different. So if you think about this at a broader level, the objective here is to help uh, students master a set of skills. And they're using a set of content, a corpus of information to master those skills. But there's an innumerable number of ways to work your way through that corpus. Textbooks are an artificial construct on how to work your way through that corpus. With Watson, you don't have that limitation of a textbook kind of a construct. Since Watson is completely familiar with everything in the corpus, any direction the student wants to go, Watson will go along with it uh, based upon the skills that they've already mastered and the knowledge that they've mastered through it. What Alex describes here is a dynamic, responsive learning experience driven by the needs of the learner. The textbook is no longer static, but can be updated on an ongoing basis. We asked Alex to tell us about the source material and process to update the content. Artificial intelligence only works on the content that it's provided. And so you have to use trusted sources of content. So the content that we're using in the context of the work we do with Pearson, they wrote the content. The system is dynamic, so it's updated continuously. Pearson updates the content as they see fit. And Watson is self-learning. So as soon as you update the content, you know, Watson retrains itself. Watson also trains itself based upon the dialogue it has with the students. So one of the things that it's able to do then is if there are uh, questions that uh, don't seem quite effective enough or there's material that isn't clear enough, then uh, those reports are given to the people who create the content so that they can modify the content appropriately. Watson can also test different variations of questions to see which questions elicit uh, the highest quality answer. So this is one of the things that's important about artificial intelligence is it's dynamic. There's no static state here because it's self-learning. This new type of technology-enabled textbook, which is interactive, responsive, and self-learning, has the potential to revolutionize teaching and learning. In many of these episodes, we have spoken about the division between curriculum, or what we learn, and pedagogy, how we learn. This is an example of a new technology which blurs the traditional lines between curriculum and pedagogy. Such new textbooks might also impact classroom design and the way students interact with each other. We also need to remember, however, that artificial intelligence applications are only as smart as the information in their databases. Alex then went on to explain how artificial intelligence might be used to create a more individualized learning experience. Teachers and students themselves can see the application of it in a way to create personalized pathways that are better aligned to their needs. I think that that's a really strong validation uh, of the approach. Also, the fact that it can sort through everything that's out there and it can provide personalized curricula to them or personalized instructional content just makes the whole process you know, much more targeted and, and uh, much simpler for, for people to do it. And the artificial intelligence can help really sort of guide that process so the experience is just uh, much simpler. It can also automate routine tasks, uh, which I think is a real benefit for everybody. And so I think that it's the combination of all of those things that really make it more effective. In our show notes from this episode, you'll see some examples of artificial intelligence being used in education. This includes an example from one of our previous guests, Akash Sethi from Quest Alliance in India, and their exploration of the possible use of chatbots. Alex went on to tell us about blockchain, which has received a lot of press in recent years as it relates to the finance industry and cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. We discussed what blockchain technology is and how it might be applied in education. The next area that's uh, become really important for us is the whole dimension of blockchain. So blockchain is an enabling technology that allows for complete transparency around where information came from 
uh, so that everybody can see that information. So a good example of that is, let's say that I've earned a credential, I've earned a grade in my astronomy class here. That grade can be written to the blockchain and I as the uh, student have to approve it being written to the blockchain and the institution that's issued the grade or the professor that's issues the grade also has to approve that it's being written to the blockchain. Now that record never goes away. It's called an immutable record. And so as a result of that, as I move through my career and I, uh, I obtain different uh, skill masteries, different credentials and so on, uh, that record stays with me for my entire life. Anybody who has access to the blockchain that I provide them access to as an individual can see where that grade comes from. So the result of that is that with complete transparency, you can see who actually issued the grade, and that allows you to make a determination about you know, the quality of the grade and the quality of the experience. It also introduces tremendous efficiency into the system because you know, it will eliminate all paper-based stuff around credentials. It's a really powerful technology in terms of raising the level of trust and transparency on data that's you know flowing across the internet. The theme of credentials came up in one of our earlier episodes when we spoke with Shana Kennedy Salko from Chiron Open Higher Education about the challenges of doing cross-national comparisons of credentials. This example shows how blockchain might be used to create a permanent, transparent, and electronic student record. These records could help streamline the university transfer process and create an alternative to paper education credentials. Alex went on to describe how blockchain could be applied in higher education. When we move into a world where everybody's credentials are available through the blockchain, where I can source education from multiple sources anywhere in the world, you start to question what's the role of an individual institution in this kind of context. So, you know, we saw that initially in the rise of the MOOCs. Uh, where people can now go and they can basically put together their own education. You see these movements around that people don't need college educations to get jobs. And in fact, you know, some of the largest employers of the world no longer require a bachelor's degree uh, as long as people have skills and credentials. The underlying philosophical strategic question for these organizations is how are they relevant in a world where me as an individual, if I know that I want to become a veterinarian, I can piece that educational uh, experience together on my own without using any individual going to any institution. And I think that that's a, a large issue for them to think about how they keep themselves relevant. This is just a lot cheaper. So, you know, efficiency is what's going to allow blockchain to take root in educational institutions because it's so much cheaper for them to do all this transcript credential stuff using blockchain, but once it's embedded, then it'll really start to move into, you know, more core areas of their business. What Alex talks about here is another theme that came up in earlier episodes, a movement towards competency-based education, shifting away from a traditional bachelor's degree towards obtaining certificates and demonstrating competency. With this shift, as Alex mentions, traditional institutions will have to consider how to keep themselves relevant. Alex then went on to explain the important role standards and standards bodies will have in educational governance. So one of the things that's emerging, there is a rise of standards um, because, you know, one of the ways that you deal with equity and quality issues around education in the online space, but also in the physical space is what are we teaching to, right? What, what skills do we need people to master? And so you do see this, especially given the technology, a very compelling need to arrive at a set of standards. What, you know, what does it mean to get a degree in psychology in the United States versus a degree of psychology in Germany? Are they really aligned? Is it the same thing? Do people have the same kind of skills? And so these questions are really coming to the fore here because of the ability of consumers to choose their own educational pathways, to craft together an education, as well as to work on a global basis. And so standard bodies are really an essential uh, governance uh, tool here um, as we move forward into the future. Alex brought the conversation back around to standards bodies and how they can create more governance around online education. In our episode on improving access to education, Shana Kennedy Salko from Chiron Open Higher Education also talked about the importance of European frameworks against which they map the curricula of their MOOC courses to ensure the content met European standards. Joan Campbell, to whom we spoke in our higher education episode, talked about streamlining course development across multiple institutions of higher education, ultimately reducing costs 
and putting a higher value on teaching and pedagogy. Alex seems to suggest that blockchain has the potential to be a key enabling technology to implement some of these ideas we've heard in this series, which may also contribute to increased governance in the online education space. But what about the permanency of blockchain? Given humans are entering the records and might make mistakes, how would errors be addressed? If you discover an error in the blockchain, you change that in the blockchain. So you'd still see the errors, but you'd also see the correction. I think the more important issue here is who has the right uh, to write to the blockchain, right? We then discuss some of the emerging issues around data privacy and regulation. We're seeing an emerging regulatory environment around personalized information that will move itself into the education space as well, because education at, at the moment is still a pretty highly regulated industry everywhere around the world. I really think we're seeing the early stages of a transformation here where people genuinely realize that all of this data, whether that be information about me, whether that be instructional content, whether it be financial information, whatever it is, that all of that information is basically readily available and can be put to you know both good and bad use. And so there's an emerging regulatory environment uh, that's coming around all of this. So California uh, recently adopted the strictest privacy regulations in the United States, uh, very aligned with GDPR in Europe. But you know this this is coming. So we're going to be in a very strong regulatory environment around personal information. As we discussed earlier in episode five on data privacy and schooling, the regulatory environment is emerging, but currently lags behind the technology. FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act of 1974, is still the main U.S. law applicable to data privacy in education, which was passed more than 40 years ago. We asked Alex how the implementation of such technologies would impact the role and profile of teachers in the future. I think that the role of the teacher becomes actually more and more important into all of this. I also think that it's critical for teachers to have a higher level of skill. Uh, that as we move into this environment where we can automate some of this, we can remove um, menial tasks from people's workday, all really good things for technology to do. The role of the teacher in terms of guiding instruction, working with a student as an individual, becomes even more important so that people don't get lost in the technology or they don't get distracted by the technology as, as well. In the future, we need teachers who really can mediate this artificial intelligence. They can look at the information. They can look at the data, they can agree or disagree with it, but they really need to mediate that information, particularly when you're working with young students. They need to decide if they look at a piece of instructional content that's been recommended by the AI engine, given what they know about the student, do they need that writer? What we don't need are teachers who follow behind the AI. We need the exact opposite. We need teachers who will lead the AI, use it as an intelligent assistant that helps you know, guide their practice in the classroom. A recurring theme of this podcast series has been the changing role and skills required for teachers as technology continues to permeate education. In our episode on higher education, Joan Campbell suggested that technology could be used in a way to free up an instructor's time to focus on coaching and provide more personalized feedback. Alex gave us an example of how both the teaching and learning experiences could be impacted with e-learning applications. As an example, so IBM is a partnership with Sesame Workshop. So one of the challenges that early childhood teachers face is that when students come into their classroom, into kindergarten, some of them have a very, very significant word gap. It all depends on how they were raised. And some come in very good on the vocabulary level, and some come in very, very far behind. So one of the primary roles of a kindergarten teacher is to close that gap. Well, how about if we could give students a really fun little iPad app, you know, uh, with Sesame Street characters that would help them close that gap? That way, I don't have to have this kindergarten teacher doing remediation with students when they could be playing a game, and the kindergarten teacher could be focusing on other things. So I don't think commodification is a bad thing if it frees people up to do things that are of higher value. Alex went on to express concerns about the introduction of some of these new technologies. The things that cause me concern at the moment when I think about the application of these advanced technologies, artificial intelligence, big data and analytics, blockchain, you know, you name it, you know, Siri, Alexa, those kinds of technologies. I worry about what's going on behind them. And I worry about them in a number of different dimensions. So one of those dimensions is cultural diversity, adoption to cultural diversity. So 
you know, most of this technology is being developed and evolved in certain areas of the world. I don't think there's any question in my mind that it comes with a cultural bias, either in terms of how it's displayed on the screen, how it interacts and talks with you. And I think that it, it's going to push towards a cultural homogenization. So I worry about cultural diversity in the context of it and losing the richness of the human experience. In the area of online higher education, we have seen a cultural bias towards the United States, given that many universities pioneering online programs and courses have been based in the U.S. On our website, you will find a blog post about an organization called Education Without Backpacks, based in Bulgaria, which sets out to take free online learning content from Khan Academy and adapt it for school children in the Bulgarian context. This is an example of an initiative that leverages the benefits of open online curricula, but at the same time addresses the issue of homogenization, which Alex mentioned. Alex then spoke about some of his additional concerns with algorithms, echoing some of what we heard in episode five. Another big area that I worry about is algorithmic bias. So remember, these are their computers, right? They're machines. So that information itself Uh, depending on how it's provided, what questions are asked, how the machine is taught to assess that information, uh, it's going to have bias in it. So you embed that bias into the algorithms. And so how you initially train the machine will determine how the machine is going to respond in the future. And that's embedded within the algorithms themselves. This is a very big area of concern for all of us who work in the domain of artificial intelligence is How is it that we create algorithms? How do we recognize the bias in them? How do we screen them out? How do we make sure that those biases don't get embedded such that they become uh, almost impossible to remove? Because remember, these these algorithms are going to have consequential decisions for people. You know, I can envision where the majority of college applications, uh, admissions decisions will be predominantly done through algorithms. Um, You're already seeing that today in terms of people who are hunting for jobs. When you send your resume in, that resume is being read by a machine, and an algorithm is determining whether or not it'll it'll make it into the next round of discussion. So these really have consequential decisions in terms of algorithm bias. Algorithmic bias is a topic that came up in our previous discussion with Elizabeth Laird in relation to primary and secondary education, or K-12, in the United States. Alex provides an example here of how algorithmic bias might happen at another educational level as individuals transition from work to school. Another concern Alex mentioned was the concept of pigeonholing individuals. You know, one of the things that's wonderful about it being a human being is the fact that we change. I am not at my age who I was 40 years ago. I'm not the same person. And so if you think about that in an educational context, I might be a very advanced student, really engaged, and, you know, I'm all over everything. But let's say over the course of the four years of my college, I get less and less interested and less and less motivated. Well, because of the fact that I was, quote, pegged as, you know, one of those achieving students, the system could lose sight of me. So I worry about pigeonholing, you know, on both sides of the dimension. The fact that these uh, these algorithms will create a profile of a person, you see that in the online marketing that you get, that doesn't reflect the fact that people actually change and grow with time. Pigeonholing or labeling can happen with these static algorithms Alex described. It can also happen independently of any technology. The final concern we discussed was about online education and social isolation. Another one is social isolation. Uh, learning is also a very highly social human activity. We like to get together. We like to collaborate. We like to talk to each other. We learn by talking to each other. And so as you see the prevalence of these technologies advance, you know, there's a real potential for social isolation here, people being less engaged. You're already seeing that in colleges where students don't attend class because they can go ahead and they can watch those lectures online and they can read the materials online. But they're missing out on the experience of being in a classroom, talking to students, talking to the professor. And I think that that's a loss. In our episode on online higher education, Joan Campbell also mentioned the example of the student choosing to attend the class online from their dorm room rather than go to the lecture hall. Social isolation is a current topic governments are grappling with throughout the world. Online education might contribute to this problem, but it might also help solve this problem by bringing people together who might not ever meet in the real world. The enabling technologies we've been discussing have the potential to create more interactive learning experiences. But the real question is, what type of learning experiences do we want to have? 
and how do we want to apply these technologies accordingly? Looking ahead, we asked Alex how he expects the discussion about technology and education will evolve. Over the last decade, as we've had the discussions around the use of technology and education, I think they've been pretty dull. It's always been about, well, what's the next great widget? Every student needs to have a laptop or every student needs to have a tablet or we need this program or we need that program. It's been very, very, I'll call it product oriented. And I, mean, I think that that conversation needs to come to an end. I think the conversation today is, you know, technology is uh, integrated and essential to education everywhere in the world today. It's part of the fabric of our lives. So we need to start to talk about it in that context. Um, and so for teacher training in the future, we need to talk about how do you train teachers to work in an environment where students will be learning in multiple, you know, multiple places. They'll be in the classroom. They'll be online. They'll be They'll be having internships. They'll be at a job. So where their education uh, really is delivered in a lot of different ways in a lot of different places. And we need to teach teachers how to operate in that environment. What, what is their role in that environment? We also need them to be digital stewards. We need teachers to be knowledgeable about how do you work with all this data? What does it mean? How do you use it? And how do you apply it? So we, we need teachers of the future to provide that kind of a leadership and not worry about, you know, do I like this application or that slate or whatever. Alex makes some great summary points as we conclude our podcast series. In the future, education will continue to evolve to accommodate new technologies. But the goal of education, be it in person or online, today or tomorrow, is to help individuals learn the most in the manner that works best for each person. Here are some takeaways from our interview with Alex. Enabling technologies such as blockchain and artificial intelligence are not necessarily going to replace the teacher, but will change the profile, training, and role of the teacher. The idea of the teacher becoming a digital steward and technologically savvy has become a recurring theme throughout this podcast series. Second, the profile and role of the student is also changing. As more enabling technologies are applied in education, students will be able to access and interact with educational content and learn in ways that are tailored to them as individuals. Finally, the promise of online education more generally has been increased access to education in a more affordable way. As we hear about the potential, we have to stop and ask if these technologies will actually reduce the cost of education. Some questions from our discussion with Alex we want to take forward for our symposium in January are, with the integration of artificial intelligence into future textbooks, what will the curricula and course development processes of the future look like? If we're looking to make teachers stewards of technology in the future, what is the profile of a future teacher? And how will the teacher training programs need to evolve to accommodate this new role? What does it mean to own your own data? And how does owning this data change how you interact online? And finally, as new technologies are developed and play a larger role in online education and its governance, how will laws and regulations need to evolve to address these changes in how people are educated today? You can find the links, show notes, and learn about our upcoming virtual symposium on the 24th of January, 2019, on our website at projectungoverned.com. If you're enjoying this podcast series, please subscribe, rate, and review Project Ungoverned on iTunes. Thank you for listening to our podcast series, Project Ungoverned, the online learning landscape. If you would like to know more about our project, including our upcoming virtual symposium on the 24th of January, 2019, please go to our website, projectungoverned.com. Project Ungoverned takes place within the Bosch Alumni Network, a network which consists of people who've been supported in one way or another by the Robert Bosch Stiftung. The network is coordinated by the International Alumni Center, IAC Berlin, a think and do tank for alumni communities with social impact. The IAC supports this podcast series and symposium. If you want to know more about the power of networks, visit iac-berlin.org. From Berlin, this is Step One, a podcast about people striving to change their world, our world. We tell you the stories of the Bosch Alumni Network, a network of doers and thinkers connected around the globe, working toward positive change. We'll travel with you around the world to learn the stories of the Bosch Alumni Network, people who are taking action, people who want to shape the future, taking their step one. 
we will hear their voices and discover their dreams. If you want to come on our journey, subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Benjamin Lorch. Stay tuned. <laughs>